Hello, hello. Is this thing on? <laughs> hello, everyone. Welcome to Temple B'nai Israel. My name is student cantor Elliot Wolf. I'm the new music director here. Uh, and we are so thrilled to have you for this presentation by our very own Eleanor Harris. Uh, just a couple quick points before we get started. This is a space where we uh, encourage eating and drinking, so as you have discovered uh, already, uh, you are welcome to do so if you want to get up, grab snacks and such. Um, during the presentation, my understanding is that's totally fine. Um, we have restrooms located outside in the lobby, and there's also a family restroom, I believe, over by the lights, I was told. That's new to me, too. See, I'm still new here. <laughs> So uh, I think those are all the big points that people need to be aware of. Um, anything else, please feel free to come up to me and ask any other questions. Uh, again, we are so thrilled to have you, and I think without further ado, I will introduce Eleanor to take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Eleanor, and I'm an intern at the Jewish Language Project this summer. And I want to start by thanking you for being here and to thank our sponsors for helping us with, with putting this programming into, into your lives. So um, I want to introduce uh, my internship supervisor and the founding director of the Jewish Language Project who's going to share some really wonderful and important information with you all today, Dr. Sarah Bunin Benor. Thank you. Everybody, thank you so much for coming. It's a really a pleasure to be here and to get to know your beautiful city. Uh, so I'm Sarah Bunin Benor. I'm a professor and vice provost at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles, and yeah, HUC. Um, and I started the Jewish Language Project in 2020. Our first event was March 15th, 2020. It was supposed to be an in-person event, but it ended up being an online event uh, about Jewish languages around Passover. And since then, we've done many, many uh, events online. And this is one of our first in-person events. So I'm really honored to, to be here. I'm going to start with a song by a singer and musician named Yoni Avi Batat from the album Fragments. And that idea of fragments is a theme in how Jews today engage with endangered Jewish languages. And this is a song called What Would You Say about the difficulties of making his grandmother's kube recipe. He says, she, she used to call me abdalak, a term of endearment particular to Iraqi Jews. It needs something sweet Your scribbled notes are guiding the way If you were here, what would you say? And it goes on like that. I know you'd want to hear the whole song, but let's, let's use that as a frame for talking about the historical transition among Jews uh, in their languages. Jews have spoken many languages around the world, and we see now that languages that have been spoken for centuries, like Judeo-Arabic, Yiddish, Ladino, Bukharian, which is spoken by Jews in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and Juhuri, which is uh, also known as judeo tat spoken by Jews in Azerbaijan and Dagestan. Um, these languages are shifting. Uh, 
uh, diminishing, becoming endangered, although not Yiddish, well, I'll explain. And many new languages are being created, Jewish versions of English and modern Hebrew. Uh, and, and because Jews shifted to English and modern Hebrew and Latin American Spanish, they are losing these other longstanding languages. So today I'm going to explain to you what are Jewish languages, where uh, were or are they spoken, why did Jews stop speaking long-standing languages, are Jewish languages endangered, and how are Jews maintaining connections to their ancestral languages. Let's start with the first two questions. So throughout history, Jews have usually spoken a variety of the local non-Jewish language, which makes them both a part of and apart from the surrounding society. So you see that purple dot in the middle of the screen? That is the land of Israel, where the Jewish people originated. And we moved from the land of Israel to all sorts of locations around North Africa, the Middle East, parts of Asia, parts of Africa, and um, much of Europe. And in each location that Jews moved to, they picked up the local language and Judaified it. So this led to languages like Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Portuguese, Judeo-Italian, Judeo-Georgian, Bukharian. Some of them have the Judeo, some of them have their own names, and, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. And even down here in, in southern India, Jewish Malayalam. The two most famous Jewish languages are Yiddish and Ladino. So raise your hand if you've heard of Yiddish. Okay, a lot, almost everyone. What about uh, Ladino? Raise your hand if you've heard of that. Many of you. Okay, raise your hand if you've heard of Jewish Malayalam before today. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, six. Okay, great. Um, well, it, m most Jews have not heard of Jewish Malayalam or um, many of these other languages. I also hadn't heard of them. And then when I was in college, I was reading an article about Romance languages, and it mentioned... Ladino, which I had heard of, and Judeo-Portuguese and Judeo-Italian. And I was so excited by this, like, what? I didn't know there were all these Jewish languages. And that's when I decided that this is what I want to do with my life, study Jewish languages. Um, but Yiddish and Ladino are actually exceptions in this history. Why? Because they were maintained for centuries away from the places where they originated. So Yiddish originated in Germanic lands, and then Jews moved to Slavic lands and lands where they spoke other languages like Hungarian and Estonian, and Jews maintained their Germanic language after that move. And same with the Ladino language, which Eleanor will tell you a little bit more about later. Jews maintained it for centuries after the Spanish expulsion when they were in lands where non-Romance languages were spoken. But most of these other languages are contiguous with their non-Jewish correlate, meaning that their non-Jewish neighbors speak a variety of the same language that they do. But how do the Jewish versions differ? Well, I see the Jewish languages as, for the most part, non-Jewish based languages with distinctive features, especially Hebrew words. And we can think of Jewish languages as existing on a continuum, from the least distinct to the most distinct. Distinct from what? From the local non-Jewish correlate. And so where would various languages be on this continuum? Well, Yiddish and Ladino would be all the way on the distinct side, because it's a completely different language than the language spoken around them, right? But many other languages are very similar to the local non-Jewish language, like Jewish Amharic, spoken in Ethiopia, has very few differences from the local um, Christian Amharic. And in fact, um, there is, they, they don't use Hebrew words because they did not have the Hebrew um, prayers and Tanakh and rabbinic literature that most other Jewish communities around the world had. French-speaking Jews and Persian-speaking Jews did have access to those Hebrew texts and prayers. And there, but the, um, the documentation 
of medieval Judeo-French and Judeo-Persian is quite similar to the local non-Jewish varieties. But then other languages are found somewhere in the middle of this continuum, like Judeo-Greek, Jewish Malayalam, and Judeo-Italian, which have many differences from, their, from Greek, Malayalam, and Italian. Um, so, and often you can tell who is um, a, a member of the Jewish community by their accent or their intonation or by certain words that they use. Judeo-Arabic actually exists in multiple parts of that continuum because it was spoken in so many different places and Jews spoke in very different ways. So Jews in Iraq um, spoke more differently from their non-Jewish neighbors than Jews in Syria, for example. Jewish Neo-Aramaic is pretty different from the Christian variety of Arabic. This is from the Kurdish region of Iraq, Iran, Syria, Turkey, and um, mostly Iraq and Iran, you, you have Christians who also speak Aramaic, and generally the Jews spoke Aramaic in ways that were more similar to each other in various communities there than to the Christian communities nearby. What about um, the question of, of what happened? Why did Jews stop speaking long-standing languages? Well, first, let's talk about broader factors in language endangerment. And this doesn't apply just to Jews. It applies to so many groups. And here in Oklahoma, I think you're quite aware of um, Native Americans and their many languages that are sadly mostly now endangered because of so many of the factors that, that I'm going to talk about now. So um, when we think about endangerment, assimilation plays a very big role. When, when people assimilate to the surrounding society, sometimes based on external factors and sometimes based on internal factors. In Jewish history, some of those factors include emancipation, uh, where the um, countries said, okay, now you are no longer a communal body, you are now individual citizens, and that sometimes came with uh, rights and responsibilities and um, requirements to have a certain type of education, or now they're allowed to have certain types of jobs, which gives them more access to the surrounding language than they previously had. And then you have internal uh, push factors um, where uh, Jews decided they wanted to be more a part of the surrounding societies. And the Haskalah, or Jewish Enlightenment, is one of, example of that in Europe. Another factor in language endangerment is migration. In Jewish communities, you have a lot of urbanization in the 19th and 20th centuries, Jews moving from smaller towns to bigger cities, which gives them access to languages they didn't have access to before. And then another type of em uh, migration is emigration, leaving the lands that they had been in for many years and moving to another land, often to escape poverty, discrimination, or violence. So to give you uh, a sense of the messiness of Jewish migrations, I put a lot of arrows there. You can see uh, the, the red arrows are Jews moving from the Middle East, North Africa, Europe, to the New World, to, uh, the, to North America, South America, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, South Africa. And then the black arrows are Jews moving from various places to Israel. And then the purple arrows are Jews moving from various places to uh, Western Europe. And all of these migrations happened um, mostly in the late 19th century through the um, mid, through, through the 20th century. Another factor in language endangerment is genocide. And this um, uh, obviously ap applies to the Jewish community with the Holocaust uh, from 1938 to 1945. Six million Jews were killed, mostly in Europe. And um, some of the, the ones who were killed were already speakers of non-Jewish languages or maybe new Jewish varieties of German, French, Dutch, etc. But most of the people who were killed in the Holocaust were speakers of long-standing Jewish languages, um, especially Yiddish, but also Ladino, Judeo-Italian, Judeo-Greek, 
and Krimchak, which was a Judeo-Turkic language spoken by rabbinic Jews in the Crimean pen Peninsula. And then in the 1950s, there were um, um, Stalinist actions against Jews, especially Yiddish writers and actors, uh, state-sponsored murders, which, which also led to the diminishment of Yiddish. Another factor in language endangerment is nationalist language policies. Um, this was especially common in the 19th century and the 20th century, where countries said, in order to uh, really be a nation, we need an official language, and we need everyone to speak that language. And uh, so this, we, we see this especially in Europe, Iran, Israel, and the United States, um, that policies where people are required to study in a particular language. So maybe this is a little hard for you to see, a little small from the back, but um, I'll just explain. So these are all the factors I've been talking about here. And so the, the red factors and the blue factors, the external and the internal factors, lead to prestige of the new language and a stigma surrounding the old language, which leads to parents speaking a new language to their children Ch or, and or children rejecting their parents' language, which eventually leads to the death of the last speaker. And then once that language, once you don't have any speakers of it, the language is considered dormant. Why dormant and not extinct? Because like a dormant volcano, it could eventually be reawakened um, with efforts at language revitalization. And you certainly have that with some indigenous uh, languages, uh, like for example, the Miamia tribe has um, efforts at, at language revitalization and reclamation. And, um, and we'll see how that's taking place a little bit in Jewish communities today. So first, um, I mentioned before that when Jews moved to new places, they picked up new languages and they Judaified them. The same thing happened after the recent migrations. So we have Jewish varieties of English, Latin American, Spanish, Portuguese, Swedish, French, German, Russian, Hungarian, etc. And these language varieties are thriving. In fact, I run a website called the Jewish English Lexicon, which has over 1,800 words that Jews use within English, from Hebrew, Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, etc. Um, that, that we use when we're speaking English. Um, and you might say, well, that's not really a Jewish language. I, I have a, another talk where I explain how it has a lot of similar uh, features to many of these long-standing Jewish languages. So Jewish English and these other language varieties are doing fine, okay? But the other languages are mostly not doing so well. And that's, that's what I'm going to focus on for the remainder of of today. We're going to talk about the, the question, are Jewish languages endangered? So first we need to figure out what endangered means. So we have a tool in macro sociolinguistics called the Expanded Graded Intergenerational Disruption Scale, EGIDS, okay? Um, and, and this has a number of stages. I'm not going to go through them all, but um, like English, for example, is, is at level zero. It's a language that's widely used between nations in trade, et cetera. Um, and then some smaller languages might be a little bit lower, like a, a provincial language um, or a language that's used in mass media without official status, et cetera. But then we get to the problematic stages, um, where stages from threatened to extinct. And um, the ones I want to focus on here are stages 8A and B, um, where age plays a big role. So 8A is moribund, where the only remaining active users of the language are members of the grandparent generation and older. And they don't say 80 or older because, you know, it, it, it's kind of uh, flexible ages. Um, and then 8B is that the only remaining users of the language are members of the grandparent generation or older who have little opportunity to use the language. Uh, and then once the last speaker is no longer alive, it becomes dormant. It serves as a reminder of heritage identity for an ethnic community, but no one has more than symbolic proficiency. 
And then it's possible that it could enter the next stage where it's no longer used and no one retains a sense of ethnic identity associated with the language. So these stages are somewhat problematic. Why? Because they're too black and white. It says things like the only speakers are, but what if you have one young person who learns the language or whose grandmother happened to teach her the language, right? Also, in the case of Jewish language varieties, sometimes speakers acquire a standard variety of the language but maintain elements of the Jewish variety that their ancestors spoke. We see this especially with Judeo-Italian and Judeo-Greek, where people speak regular Italian and regular Greek, but maintain some words or phrases or maybe intonations that their uh, grandparents used. So would they be considered speakers of that language? Then we have the issue of a language versus a dialect, which I'm sure a lot of you have been thinking about, right? Well, are these all languages or aren't they just dialects or maybe even like special ways of speaking a particular dialect? So in linguistics, we talk about mutual intelligibility as a criterion for distinguishing between two dialects and two separate languages, meaning if you can understand someone who speaks another language variety, then you speak the same language. You just speak different dialects of it. But even that is problematic because uh, sometimes people who speak one way say they can understand the people who speak the other one, but not vice versa, right? Um, and um, the way that we think about languages is so influenced by political factors that we think about Hindu, Hindi and Urdu as separate languages, even though they're mutually intelligible because they're spoken in India and Pakistan and they have different writing systems. Um, same with some of the Scandinavian languages like Swedish and Danish, they're so similar, they can understand each other, but they're separate languages because they have political power behind them. Um, so these are all very complicated things, and so it's really hard to say how many languages are there or how many people are speakers of a particular language. Another problem is who do you consider a speaker? Do you have to be fluent to be a speaker? What if you understand a little bit? What if you, what if you understand it but can't speak it? What if you know it but never use it? Or what if you just, in, you don't know the language at all, but you engage with it by singing songs that you don't understand, but it's important to you. Are you considered a speaker? Okay, so there are all these problems, but even so, I still think the statistics are somewhat useful. And so I'm gonna give them to you with all these caveats. Another concept that I wanna throw at you is this idea of post-vernacularity. So vernacular means you know, a language that's used for everyday life. Post-vernacular means uh, when people engage with a language in ways that are different from how it is normally used. So most people who use Yiddish words and talk about Yiddish can't actually understand full Yiddish sentences. And with a post-vernacular mode, the fact that something is said in Yiddish is more significant than what is actually said, right? Um, and this is a concept from Jeffrey Chandler's book, Adventures in Yiddishland, that Eleanor and I are both gonna refer to uh, throughout our analysis of how people are engaging with endangered Jewish languages. So an example of post-vernacularity is Yiddish words used within English, within English sentences. Like, maybe you guys can think of some of those. Just shout out some of those words. Chutzpah. Chutzpah. Sh schmuck? Did you say schmuck? What else? Schlep. Schlep. Mensch. Okay, so, and these are words that are, some of them are used primarily among Jewish uh, descendants of Yiddish speakers. Some of them are used more broadly within Jewish communities, whether or not their grandparents spoke Yiddish. And some of them have gotten into the broader American lexicon, right? Um, so that's an example of post-vernacular engagement with Yiddish. Um, another example is tchotchkes, which is also a Yiddish word, uh, that have Yiddish words on them. Or Yiddish performance. There's a theater in New York called the Volksbühne, which does plays in Yiddish with surtitles. And they just did a great production of Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. 
if it ever comes to Oklahoma City, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, so that would be great. Um, and then there's performance of Yiddish songs and festivals and translation of Yiddish literature into English. And so all of these are examples of ways that people are engaging with this language that's not as a vernacular, that's not being used for everyday communication. Another concept here that's useful is meta-linguistic community. That is, people who engage around a language, even if they don't speak it, but they're celebrating the language. They're, there's a Yiddish club or a Yiddish class, and yeah, they're learning some of the language, and maybe they'll use it for communication a little bit, or maybe they'll use it for research to read old Yiddish newspapers, but really, they're celebrating the language. They're, they're, they're creating a metalinguistic community around that language. Okay, so now that we've gone over all these concepts, we can answer this question. And, but I'm also gonna give you statistics about not just how many people speak it and how old they are, but also to what extent people are engaging in metalinguistic ways, uh, in post-vernacular ways with the language. So Yiddish is not endangered. It is doing very well. Why? Because it is used in Hasidic communities. In the New York area, in uh, Antwerp, in Belgium, in London, and in uh, Israel, there are very vibrant communities that speak Yiddish where the young people are learning Yiddish in normal ways that languages are transmitted from parent to child. Outside of the Hasidic world, there is decline in that people aren't speaking Yiddish that their grandparents spoke. They're speaking English instead, or Hebrew, or Latin American Spanish, or French, or whatever. Um, but there is very strong post-vernacular engagement with Yiddish. Many young people today are interested in Yiddish. All of the other long-standing Jewish languages that I've been talking about are endangered or close to endangered. So now I'm going to give you the statistics. Um, so, so here's Eastern Yiddish, and, and I'm distinguishing here between Eastern and Western Yiddish because we'll see that Western Yiddish is not doing so well. Eastern Yiddish, which was spoken in um, Central and Eastern Europe, essentially, I, I mean, mostly Eastern Europe, but then also Hungary and other countries near there, um, is there are, even though there has been a major decline in the number of speakers, you can't just look at the numbers to see what's endangered. You also have to uh, figure out who, what age groups are speaking it. So 8 million speakers in 1900, 950,000 speakers today, but it's doing very well. It's in the educational phase, um, meaning it's, it's used in educational settings, um, and it's used by people of all generations. So Ladino... Um, also, we saw a big decline in 350,000 to 100,000, and I uh, would put that in stage 8A, meaning it's moribund, but there is also a lot of post-vernacular activity in Ladino. How many of you have heard a Ladino song? A lot of you, wow, okay. And so um, that is um, an example of how, how this language is being engaged with in post-vernacular ways. Um, and then I, I, I have a little trouble distinguishing between uh, Judeo-Persian and Jewish-Persian. So traditionally, Judeo-Persian refers to Persian or Farsi written in Hebrew letters. But the uh, Persian Jewish communities today don't write their language in Hebrew letters, but they might use Persian with Hebrew words and distinctive features that are that come down to them through the generations, um, and so that language is doing pretty well. It's 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 shifting because most Jews left Iran in 1979 and some before that. Um, There's still about 10,000 Jews in Iran, but the Jews who left Iran are still mostly alive, and so they live in Israel, the U.S., and other places, and are still speaking Persian, but are mostly not transmitting it to their children and very little to their grandchildren. And there is some post-vernacular activity, some efforts to learn, to learn Persian. Um, Judeo-Arabic, we see a huge decline from 
um, 900,000 speakers in 1900 to about 60,000 today. And most of the people who speak Judeo-Arabic are older. There is some post-vernacular engagement, which you saw at the beginning with that song I played from Yoni Avi Batat, who grew up in the US, but his grandparents are from Iraq, and he is interested in engaging with his grandparents' language, even though he doesn't speak it. So then we get to some interesting statistics here. We see that these numbers are bigger than the 1900 numbers. Why would there be more speakers today of Bukharian, Juhuri, and Jewish Neo-Aramaic than there were 123 years ago? Well, this has to do with um, lower infant mortality, uh, the communities doing better, um, medical innovations, and um, just an, an easier time uh, surviving childhood in the early 20th century. But, and so it, it sort of looks like, oh yeah, they're doing fine, the numbers are going up. Not at all. They're, these are, these languages are really not doing well because it's, it's mostly older people who speak them. Juhuri is a little bit of an exception. It is spoken in um, Azerbaijan, Dagestan, and there is actually a town there where people still speak Juhuri today. It's called Kirmizi Kasaba, uh, also known as Red Village or Krasnaya Sloboda in Azerbaijan. And, and young people there do still learn uh, Juhuri, but most of those uh, people have, have left the town, have left Azerbaijan and moved primarily to Israel and elsewhere. Um, so there, I would say it's, it's, it's in level seven rather than 8A or B. Um, Jewish Neo-Aramaic and Hakitiya, North African Judeo-Spanish, are in stage 8A, moribund. Then we get to Jewish Iranian languages, which I'm going to tell you more about in a minute, and we'll see that they're nearly extinct. It's very hard to find people who, who, uh, who use those languages. There is some post-vernacular engagement in all of these languages, but very little in Jewish Iranian languages. And then we get to um, other languages that are doing not so well. Um, and we can see there's very few speakers of, of these languages here. Um, Judeo-Tamazicht, also known as Berber, is a language that was spoken in North Africa. And um, most Jews in North Africa spoke Ladino or Hakatiya or Judeo-Arabic and eventually French. But small communities in rural areas did speak judeo tamazicht and you can find some elderly speakers of that today. Um, a language that I didn't include on here, but I want to just mention, is Jewish Algerian Sign Language, where um, we just we don't know exactly how many speakers there were, but when Jews migrated from Algeria to Israel in the 1960s, 1970s, um, the the, there, was, there was a large um, deaf community in one town called Gardaya in Algeria, and they created their own sign language there called Jewish Algerian Sign Language. And when they moved to Israel, most of them learned Israeli sign language because they integrated into deaf communities there, but they continued to speak uh, or to use Algerian Jewish sign language with their children. So the hearing children of deaf Jews who immigrated from Algeria are maintaining this language. Pretty interesting. Um, I mentioned Krimchak, the Turkic language, nearly extinct. I can't find any speakers to, uh, to interview to document that language. Um, same with Judeo-Greek and Judeo-Italian, but there is some um, post-vernacular engagement, um, some theater happening in Judeo-Italian today. Um, and then Western Yiddish is uh, also no more speakers but there is some in desire to engage with that language. So now we get to the final question. How are Jews maintaining connections to their ancestral languages? I'm going to give you examples from three languages or language families. Uh, Judeo-Arabic, which is really several different languages that are not mutually intelligible, but have some similar features. Judeo-Iranian and Jewish Neo-Aramaic. I'll give you a brief history of these, talk about their current status, and the post-vernacular activity happening surrounding these languages. So Judeo-Arabic is spoken in the yellow areas. And you can see it's a very wide geographic span 
where these languages were spoken. Uh, it stems back to pre-Islamic eras, uh, where there is evidence that Jews spoke Arabic before the Islamic conquest. And then we have early and classical Judeo-Arabic. Some famous texts were written in Judeo-Arabic by Sa'ad Gaon and Yehuda Halevi and Maimonides. There's also a lot of evidence of written Judeo-Arabic in the Cairo Geniza. Uh, the Geniza is a collection of documents that Jews preserved because they didn't want to destroy the word, um, the, the name of God, right? And, but then that got extended to anything written in Hebrew letters. And so this, uh, there's this amazing treasure trove of documents written in Hebrew letters in Cairo that was maintained in a synagogue um, like, like up there. It's like if you kept a bunch of stuff up there and then someone found it hundreds of years later, right? And now you probably have a Geniza here too, right? Yeah. So anyway, um, a lot of documents in the Geniza um, show us how people were speaking or writing in the 12th century, the 11th century, in Cairo or in other places when they were writing letters to people living in Cairo. So you have letters from Prague and from the Holy Land and from um, Afghanistan. And like all, all of these letters are found in the Cairo Geniza. There are also Genizas elsewhere. There's an Afghani Geniza that has some Judeo-Persian documentation. But then when we get to contemporary or modern Judeo-Arabic, we see that the local uh, languages are more similar to the non-Jewish variety than to each other. So like if you live in Egypt, your language is going to be different enough from someone who lives in um, Syria that you might not be able to understand each other, you might understand some, but they also have some common traits reflecting migrations of Jews within the Arabic-speaking world. And there were periodicals. You know, you may have heard of Yiddish newspapers. There were also Judeo-Arabic newspapers in the 19th and 20th centuries. For example, in Mumbai in 1856, uh, there was a, um, a, an Iraqi Judeo-Arabic newspaper because Iraqi Jews had moved to India. Um, in Oran, Algeria, and Cairo, Tunis, Tangier, Morocco, Baghdad, you see these, these um, Judeo-Arabic newspapers. From the 1940s to 60s, most Judeo-Arabic speakers left the lands that they were living in and moved to Israel, France, Canada, Mexico, and the United States. I mentioned Mexico because there is a sizable Syrian Jewish community in Mexico City that did maintain some phrases from Judeo-Arabic and now use it within their Mexican Spanish. Um, there are still sizable Jewish communities in North Africa today, about 3,000 in Morocco, but most of them have shifted to French. And in Tunisia, about 1,000, um, they tend to speak Muslim Tun Tunisian Arabic and some elements of Judeo-Arabic. But there's lots of post-vernacular engagement with Judeo-Arabic, especially in Israel. And now I'm going to give you a little video example of that. Yeah, I know, I, I also want to hear the rest of it, but we don't have much time, so I want to uh, finish up. So there's also a Facebook group in Hebrew called Preserving the Iraqi 
language, which means Judeo Iraqi Judeo-Arabic. And you can tell that it's post-vernacular because it's in Hebrew, right? <laughs> they're engaging with the language. Primarily, their questions are in Hebrew, like, how do you say something in Iraqi, right? Um, and then um, there's... Uh, yeah, so I would say that Iraqi, I mean, that Judeo-Arabic is in stage 8A. It's moribund, but there is some post-vernacular use, and it's very important for group identity. Now let's turn to Judeo-Iranian languages. So in the country of contemporary Iran, there are several distinctive um, languages, and I call them languages because they're not mutually intelligible. So it's the cities that Jews, cities and towns that Jews lived in, in Iran. Um, and when we think about Judeo-Persian, that's a different thing. That is Persian written in the Hebrew alphabet, whereas Judeo-Kashani, Judeo-Esfahani, Judeo-Shirazi, etc., are non-written Iranian languages that are etymologically distinct and mutually intelligible with Persian. So if you speak Persian, you can't understand these other languages unless you have learned them. Um, and in fact, here's a language family tree. We have family trees for people. We also have them for languages. And in the Iranian language family, you have Persian, the Persian branch over here, right? Um, that's where Persian is. And also Juhuri, or judeo taught and also Bukharian. They're, on, they're, they're similar enough to Persian that they can kind of understand each other. But the, the uh, other, most of the other languages spoken by Jews in Iran are on this branch, in the Median family, which is a totally separate family. And so here's an example, just one word, the word for dog in these languages. And you can see how different they are. But some of them are similar to each other. So, um, the, and most of these are in the Median family. Uh, Judeo-Shirazi is in the same family as Persian. Um, and, but the word for dog is keleb, which is actually a word from Hebrew. Um, and, but the other ones, espe, kude, kuye, et cetera, there's some similarities, but they're pretty different. And in fact, the central plateau dialects of Kashan, it's a province in Iran, were mostly replaced by Persian in the 20th centuries, but Jewish communities maintained them. So these languages survive in a few rural communities of Muslims and Zoroastrians and among the elderly Jewish Kashani immigrants who moved to the United States and Israel. Um, and just to give you a sense of how they use Hebrew, they have a lot of Hebrew loan words, um, maybe fewer than Yiddish or Ladino, but, um, and most of those words relate to religious concepts, but then there's these random phrases that, that are maintained from textual Hebrew, like in Judeo-Yazdi, the city of Yazd, Yazd um, they begin stories by reciting a Hebrew formula, B'Shem Hashem Nase Onasliach, which is B'Shem Hashem Nase Unatsliach, right? That in the name of God, we will do and be successful. And, and here's another example of the, the um, Hebrew words. So the word for Shabbat, the word Shabbat appears in the names of the days of the week in Judeo Esfahani. Um, whereas in Persian, it's Yek Shanbe. In Judeo Esfahani, it's Ye Shabbat. Um, and so you can just see how this is a common phenomenon in Jewish languages around the world, incorporating Hebrew words. So, what happened to Jewish Iranian languages? In the mid 20th century, most Jews learned standard Persian with some Hebrew words in their cities and towns or after moving to Tehran. And this was because of those language policies I mentioned before, that the government said everyone has to learn standard Persian as an effort at modernizing and, and, and nationalism. And then, so, so these languages were already in decline before the 1979 migration. But now, since most Jews have left Iran, they are not only um, losing their longstanding languages of these Judeo-Iranian languages, but also the Persian that they picked up in the last few generations. And there is some effort to document these languages. The Endangered Language Alliance in New York 
is doing that, and the Jewish Language Project, which I run, is also uh, working on that. And I'm going to give you a little clip of the kind of uh, videos we've been recording. It's so fast. I understood the much. <laughs> okay. Um, well, oh, there we go. Um, and so these languages are in stage 8b, that they're nearly extinct, and there's very little post-vernacular activity. But as I'll show you later, I'm trying to help that along a little bit. And then the final language I want to give you an example of is Jewish Neo-Aramaic. This was spoken in the Kurdish region that I mentioned before. This is an ancient Jewish community with an ancient language. It's related to the Aramaic of the Talmud, but the language has changed a lot, and it's, the, the way they speak is quite different from the language in the Talmud. Um, some of the uh, dialects of Jewish Neo-Aramaic were spoken by several thousand people in a town, but some were only sp spoken by a few families in a small village. And sometimes you wouldn't be able to understand people in the next village because the communities were, were more uh, insular. Um, but here's an example of how the Jewish communities were more similar to each other than to a local Christian community. You can see the words um, had some differences, but also um, are quite similar, and the Christian words are pretty different. And, you know, in America today, most Americans only speak one language, right? Um, but in most places around the world, people tend to be multilingual. And that was certainly the case in the Kurdish region where there were many languages together. And so people who spoke Jewish Neo-Aramaic would also have spoken Kurdish, Turkish, Farsi, Arabic, and Russian, for example. Why Russian? There was some Russian influence in the region. Um, let me give you some examples of how these languages influenced Jewish Neo-Aramaic. Um, to say that a woman is pregnant, speakers of Hula Ula, which is Jewish Neo-Aramaic from Sanandaj, Iran, would use the expression Bachta Tre Gyane, which means a woman with two souls. Uh, and that's an influence from Kurdish. And what happened to Jewish Neo-Aramaic? Well, the same old story. Most speakers moved to Israel, some to the US and to Europe, and they shifted to the new local languages. Here's an example of a young person engaging in a post-vernacular way with his father's language. This book by Ariel Sabar um, is about his father, Jonas Sabar, who is a professor emeritus at UCLA and um, is a native speaker of Iraqi Jewish Neo-Aramaic from Zaho, Iraq. And Ariel, in this book, uh, writes about his father's history and, and uh, about learning about his father's engagement with this language. There is also some post-vernacular engagement in Israel. Most, uh, there's, there's monthly cultural gatherings, poetry readings, stand-up comedy, TV and radio shows in Jewish Neo-Aramaic. There's a, uh, an organization called the Lishana Institute that tries to uh, get uh, more uh, policy changes that benefit this language, and there's new music. Most of the people who are doing this are elderly. Let me show you an example of a theater troupe. Um, 
انا فكرنا ما اخي لي تبع لا تكبر هذا الشوخي. لهالمو هالمو بالي هالمو صار ما يستخدم صار ما يستخدم هالمو بالهكك. اوه قبعت And then they start singing. Um, so it's mostly older people performing and mostly older people in the audience. And you can hear they laugh. They, they, it's, it's like connected to them, right? But there are also some young people who are engaging in this. Uh, this is Adi Kadusi and Alona Zizi who live in Israel. And this is a song called Aramaic Lesson uh, from their album Hula Ula. By the way, Hula Ula, I just have to tell you, is a fascinating word that comes from Yehuda Uta, Yehuda Utha, which becomes Hula Ula, um, and it literally means Judaism. But so Hula Ula means Jewish, just like Yiddish means Jewish, right? Um, anyway, you'll see this song is uh, a little Aramaic lesson. She is a native speaker of Hebrew. She doesn't speak this language, but she's learning a little bit because it's her ancestral language. <laughs> Okay, so it goes on, um, and um, it's very uh, modern, right? It's not the traditional musical style, although there's some influence of that. So Jewish Neo-Aramaic is in stage 8a, moribund, but there is some post-vernacular use, and it is important for group identity. So in conclusion, most long-standing Jewish language varieties are moribund, stages 8a or higher. And in the next 20 to 30 years, sadly, the last speakers will likely die. And so really now is the time for us to document these language varieties, and also the cultures and histories that go along with them. And it's also time to share that knowledge, because if we don't share that knowledge, then we'll be less likely to find the people that we need to record. And if we don't share that knowledge, then the recordings will just sit there in archives. Why is this important? Well, for people who speak these languages, like Simon Mardachayev, who lives in New York, but is originally from Azerbaijan. He's a native speaker of Juhuri, and he wants people to learn his language. He's sad that he is the last person in his family who speaks that language. Or people who have passed away, like Sarah Cohen, who was one of the last people who spoke Jewish Malayalam in India. It's also important for academia, for scholarship. If we want to learn the histories of these communities, having a documentation of their language is very important. It's also important for students who want to learn the language. If they want to learn the language 100 years from now, they can't learn it if we don't document it well, the people are still alive. It's also useful for Jews around the world to feel a connection to each other. This is a picture of um, that um, town I mentioned in Azerbaijan where they do still speak Juhuri. And this is uh, American and Israeli Jews interacting and meeting each other. And, and for a sense of Jewish peoplehood, it's useful to learn how Jews around the world have similarities and differences in our languages. It's also useful for other groups, for indigenous, immigrant, and religious groups who have a special language that they want to maintain a connection to even after they've shifted to another language. And so Jews can learn from these other groups and they can learn from us as they incorporate um, Tamil from Sri Lanka and um, Elam Pomo uh, from a tribe in California and Hawaiian into their English language. 
So how are we doing this work? Well, we created a consortium of many organizations, 12, not many, 12 organizations that are doing um, education, research and education about Jewish languages, and we work together to um, make this work more efficient. Um, the, the organization that I run, the Jewish Language Project, has the mission of promoting research on awareness about an engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. And we do this in many ways. Here are some of our current projects. Uh, we're really focusing on Iranian Jewish languages because that's the language family that we found the least research on. And we, uh, I'm based in LA, and so there are lots of Iranian Jews in LA. Um, we post fun facts on social media, little nuggets of information about Jewish languages. We're working on an exhibit with ANU, Museum of the Jewish People, that's going to be a downloadable uh, exhibit that you can print out and put in your synagogue lobby or in a museum or a JCC. Um, we're uh, working on a website exhibit on theater in Jewish languages. That's one of Eleanor's projects as an intern. And we're, we're creating curricular resources for Jewish schools, focusing primarily on middle school. Uh, we're also creating multilingual resources. We have lots of resources for Passover. There's a Haggadah supplement on that table out there. Um, there's also um, swag uh, that, from the Jewish Language Project that is aimed to raise awareness about Jewish linguistic diversity. And if you want, you're welcome to take an item from that table and make a donation to the Jewish Language Project. And Eleanor can help you with that after, after we're done here. Um, and we also have events. We have concerts and lectures, mostly online and now also in person, thanks to you all. Uh, and we're working on some dictionaries of living Jewish languages, uh, thriving languages like Jewish Latin American Spanish and Jewish Russian and Jewish French and Jewish English, and also of endangered Jewish languages. And we also have commissioned some original recordings of songs in languages that didn't have much post-vernacular engagement. Here's a quick clip from uh, Galit Dardashti, who we commissioned to record a song in Judeo Esfahani, one of her ancestral languages. <laughs> And so we do this to enable young people to access fragments of their ancestral linguistic treasures, right? It's, it's not accessing the whole language. It's really accessing a fragment of it. And this is, I'm going to end with a quote by the uh, same performer that I started with, Yoni Avi Batat, from a, a song of his called From the Fragments. He says, from the fragments of the voices, I can sing my own song. I'm singing my song. Thank you very much. And now I am thrilled to turn the microphone over to Eleanor Harris. She has been an intern for the Jewish Language Project this summer. She's done so much research on Jewish theater, and she's also done other things like design some um, some merchandise for us, and we didn't we didn't get that in time to display it here, but it's it's on our website. You can you can find it. She made some pronoun stickers in in Hebrew and Yiddish, and um, and 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 some other exciting things. And she's gonna uh, tell us about her research about language in Jewish theater or theater in Jewish languages. Eleanor Harris. Hi, everyone. Um, so let's do another round of applause for Dr. Sarah Bunin-Benor. Um, 
Yeah, so that was so, so amazing and so informative and wonderful for, for us to learn to learn from you. So thank you so much for that. And now we're going to transition into more specifically theater that happens in Jewish languages and that has happened for a long time in Jewish languages. So first, let's define what Jewish theater is. What are what are we talking about here? So I I want to use this definition today that it's theater by Jews and usually for Jews, and it's often in Jewish languages. And a lot of times it might deal with content concerning Jewish traditions, values, stories, humor, culture, all of that. It doesn't always, but essentially it has one it has one or more of these um, of these qualities to make it Jewish theater in our definition for today. So we're going to look at three different um areas of Jewish theater because I don't have time to talk about all of my research. But you'll see in the exhibit in the next couple weeks on the website, you can look and find a lot more. But we're going to talk about the origin of the Purim Spiel. And we're going to talk about modern modern usage of, um, of the languages in post-vernacular situations in Turkey and in Israel. So we're going to start with a moment to think about what connects all of these different all of these different theater initiatives around the world and throughout time like why are they why do they mean anything to each other so this quote or this um little tidbit is sort of to show how how long Jewish theater has been happening so there was an Alexandrian Jew named Ezekielos who made a a drama about the exodus in the second century BCE and he he wrote it and some of it is still um you have parts of it are um preserved and that is you know so long ago and so much has happened since then in so many different places that it's um it's just really interesting that throughout time and place we use Jewish language in drama as a storytelling device and all of the theater initiatives that we talk about today are connected because they all come from the impulse to create community and to connect with our culture and our heritage. They come from the same need for all of that Um, and I want to have that baseline before we continue. So we're going to start with the Purim spiel. So um, Purim is, for those who don't know, a holiday that recounts the bravery of Mordechai and Esther. They were ancient Persian Jews who stood up to a plot to kill all of the Jews in the kingdom. And the Jews of this kingdom, Shushan, survived. And as a result, we get silly every year. So many communities tell the story in a theatrical, over-the-top, silly, goofy performance. And that performance we like to call the Purim Spiel. And if you have heard the word spiel before, you, um, you, it's a lot of, used in Jewish English. Um, we hear it a lot in our daily lives um, that it's just, it's a... You, I, I, you can know what a spiel is, but, um, <laughs> but so it's a spiel about Purim, and so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, um, before we talk about the modern times and what we do today with that, um, I want to talk about a long time ago, so go ahead and close your eyes, we're gonna do an exercise, and close your eyes, and imagine yourself in 15th century Eastern Europe. So that could mean a lot of things, but right now we're going to focus on right now you're in your dining room at your table with your family and it's Purim and it's time to read Megillat Esther, the story of Esther, and you sit at your large dining table, you have friends and family commemorating the holiday with a festive meal. Your sister laughs as your nephew refills the wine glasses, and outside you hear the clip-clop of horses' hooves and the voices of the players slowly coming within earshot. It's almost time for the Purim play. So open your eyes, and let's talk about it. So in the 15th century, the Purim spiel had its start as a traveling act. 
act. So there was a troop of well-known Jewish community members, not professional actors, but people that were known by each other. They went from home to home telling the Purim story. So everyone would be sitting in their homes eating their festive meal and they'd hear, oh, they're coming. And then they'd come through the door and they'd say, okay, it's time. And then everyone would say, okay, great. And they would do the play for them and then they would go to the next house. And that is the way that they would do it at the beginning. And it was um, inspired by things like Christmas caroling and things that were happening in Eastern Europe at the time in surrounding communities. And it really started from there. So this picture is from the 17th century, um, and it's a drawing of Purim players um, in in that time, that time period and how it's, it's continued throughout this time. So there's a lot to unpack and discuss about original Purim spiels, but you'll see that in the coming weeks. But um, the interesting thing that I want to talk about today is the similarity of the silliness that has been maintained throughout this all of this time. And um, one of the things that I think contributes to how fun a Purim spiel is supposed to be is that the people who are performing are not outsourced. And they're, they're not people that are necessarily professional actors. They could be. But a lot of times they are from within the community. And we know them as dentists and waitresses and journalists and different things. And we see them on stage. And that's fun because we know them. And we get to go up to them after and say, so, you know, you remembered all your lines. Or before we can say, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna mark when you when you mess up, or or there's there's that silliness that comes along with knowing the people, and that has main, been maintained for hundreds of years. Just that one aspect, and I think that sort of that sort of tradition that has continued is really really amazing. So. Now we're going to move into Jewish theater in Turkey and the Ottoman Empire previously. So, uh, so the expulsion of Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, um, from Spain and over to the Ottoman Empire. So Jews went from Spain to lots of different places, but right now we're going to talk about moving to the Ottoman Empire and to modern day Turkey and, and Istanbul. So um, Sephardic Jews brought 15th century Spanish language with them, and it continued to develop independently from the Spanish that we might know today in Spain or in Latin America. And so this is Ladino, Judeo-Spanish, like, like Sarah said, and Ladino is, um, is in the endangered, moribund sort of area. So... Since Jews' arrival in the Ottoman Empire after the 1492 Spanish expulsion, they have had an impact on Jewish theater from the beginning. So there was this development of a type of theater, Orta Oyunu, or the theater in the round, and it was heavily influenced by Jews in the early Republican era. And then flash forward about 500 years, and in the 70s, the 1970s, um, a large number of Turkish Jews moved to Israel. And so there were a lot less Jews who spoke Ladino, Judeo-Spanish in Turkey itself, in the Ottoman, in that area, in Istanbul. And so this erosion of the speakers in, in Turkey created a need for revival. And so there were these attempts to preserve the Judeo-Spanish language through music and theater. And so one of those efforts that started in the 70s was um, Moise plays. So Moise is a, is a type of word to say Moses. So it's one of the, one of the different variations of Moses, Moshe, Moisha, you know, all of the different things. And so Jojo Eskenazi is a is a man in Turkey who created these plays and he plays the character of Moise and they are the longest running plays using Judeo-Spanish and the series has continued since the 70s with lots of runs of different different storylines with the same characters and so they're about 
so Moise is a middle class Jewish businessman in Turkey, and he he and his wife Clarette speak Judeo Spanish together and with their elders, and they speak Turkish with their children and their in laws and neighbors. So there's multiple languages happening at once on the stage, and they're family comedies. They're slapstick. They have this vaudevillian structure and satirical and political undertones, and people love them because they're fun and they are funny and they help to preserve the language. So they create a space for people to hear the language in a fun way, especially for the young the younger generations because the youngest generation of speakers is the grandparent generation in Istanbul. And so it's important for the young people to be exposed in an interesting way. And the mix of Judeo, Spanish, and Turkish on the stage make it for a larger amount of people to be able to understand it. So Moise plays are also facilitators of community building because, um, for instance, in 2013 and 2015, there were performances that had the intention of fundraising for scholarships for students at a local Jewish private school. And so that helps, um, that is helping the Jewish community directly as well. And I had the wonderful opportunity to speak with um, a professional in Turkey, um, Karen Gershon Sarhon, who is um, really wonderful and committed to preservation of Judeo-Spanish in lots of areas, including theater, and also in music and in publications and all sorts of different ways. And she was part of the Moise plays at the beginning. She played the original Moise's wife, Clarette. That was her at the beginning. Um, and so I was able to interview her. And she was telling me that when she was a kid in Istanbul, Jews mostly lived close together. And it was a small community. It was a small Istanbul was smaller, and everyone lived closer together. And after school, the kids would go to the youth the youth club and hang out and make theater together and um, just create. And now Istanbul is a lot larger, and people are more spread out, and there's traffic, and it's harder to get to the youth club. And logistics are hard, and so there's less togetherness, and there's less opportunity to create together. Um, and she says that it's difficult to find people who are able to, uh, to act in Ladino. Um, so it's, it's been a struggle, but she says, but we're doing fine. That's what she said. So, so now we're going to talk about some more post-vernacular um, activity in Israel. So we're going to talk about a few different languages that are that are being preserved in various in various theater theatrical ways and um so just a just a reminder of what post vernacularity means is you know it's no longer used for communication between people it's used in a symbolic way and it's used in in art or in theater and um it's not spoken for communication but in Israel, where the revival of Hebrew often meant the discouragement of using other languages, immigrants crave cultural events in their mother tongues. And not only that, but the descendants of immigrants long to feel connected to their heritage. So Israeli Jewish theater appears in languages like the Juhuri that, um, that Sarah spoke about, or the Maghrebi from Morocco and Amharic from Ethiopia. So in Israel, uh, theater is one of the only public arenas in the country where Jewish languages are used naturally as a primary form of communication between characters on stage and between stage and audience, which is so precious and so special for, um, for the people who, who want to hear it, who don't hear it very much, because in, in Israeli culture, Mostly they speak Hebrew, <laughs> and they don't hear their language as much as they could. And so Jewish Maghrebi is the language of Moroccan Jews. So there is a Moroccan Jewish community in Israel. And I read um, by, uh, in, a, 
in a paper by Sarit Kaufman Simchon, who has a new book out in Hebrew that I haven't read because it's in Hebrew, but that I wish I could read, and maybe one day I will. But in English, I read that she said, for those for whom Jewish Maghrebi is not to post vernacular, those who still speak it, the happy reunion with their language in a public space constitutes an affirmative action. However, for the Israeli-born spectators of Moroccan descent, this very same language triggers imagined nostalgia, which is intimately intertwined with the history of migration in Israel. So after seeing theater in the Maghrebi language in Israel, native speakers, Moroccan Jews, have never-ending praise for it. So here we have a couple of quotes of people who haven't heard their language on a stage before and haven't lived in the, their home, their original homes where they heard the language all the time for, for many years. And so um, the top one is, um, you know, the show is wonderful. It brings back words, memories, you know, proverbs, things that you didn't, you didn't think of, but then you heard it and you remembered it. And you're like, oh, oh, I loved that. I, I forgot about that and that, that joy. And then the second one is it's um, a father talking to, talking to his son, and he's saying, like, I laughed and I cried and I forgot how beautiful and funny my language is, and, and I haven't seen your mother laughing like that in a really long time. And that is so precious and so, so important because just being able to sit back and relax and understand what's happening without having to translate all the time and without having to work so hard to to be connected you're able to just ah, and laugh and just be there and that is so important and it's really wonderful that this is able to happen for these people so um, that's some of the importance of post vernacular post vernacular activity and so another initiative is the Amharic Ethiopian, Ethiopian Theater. It's called Tizida, um, which means memories or nostalgia. And it was established by, um, by Fruit Farada in 2016. So these are some of the players. I couldn't find a video of this one, but there will be a video soon of a different, of a different troupe. And um, so these are the players of Tizita, the Amharic Ethiopian Theater in Israel, established by Farid Farada. And Amharic is a language spoken in Ethiopia where Jews have lived for more than 1,500 years. So Farada says that the theater in Israel gives proud and nourishing expression to community members and gives us a basis for preserving the beautiful language and culture we grew up with. And it answers the need of youngest in the community to identify with Amharic and is aimed then not only at adults, but to children. It's saying, be proud of your heritage. And another language that is featured in post-vernacular Hebrew, in, that is featured in post-vernacular in Israel, is Juhuri. And that is an endangered language spoken by Jews from Dagestan and Azerbaijan. So Rambam Mountain Jewish Theater is um, a theater in Israel. It began by a different name in the 1930s in Durbend, Dagestan, and it moved to Khadera, Israel in the 20th century. So it's brought theater in Juhuri to communities in Israel and in Russia and also in the United States and North America, and um, it's... Uh, it's recently ceased production, but um, I'd like to show a video that is from a few years back that uh, showcases showcases a comedy, a part of a comedy that they did, that they did. And I just think that's so wonderful, especially, 
especially including the um, the part of the audience, that how much they were enjoying it and talking to each other about it and just connecting was just really struck me. And um, that was really important, I thought, to include in, in that video. So next, next I'm going to go to the next slide, hopefully, if it... Yes. <laughs> so um, to conclude, I want to say that in addition to storytelling and community building that has come from Jewish theater throughout the ages, in modern times, it preserves language in post-vernacular contexts, and it creates spaces for people to enjoy and to connect with both the language they used to speak and or the language that their parents spoke or their grandparents spoke or that they heard around the house or that they feel they feel ethnically and culturally connected to. And so, um, again, I want to say thank you. And I'm working on this exhibit for theater um, on the Jewish Language Project website. So in the next couple of weeks, my internship will be coming to a close, sadly. But that does mean that my exhibit will be up. And so all of this information and more about Jews in the Renaissance in Italy and a million other things. Not a million. Don't count. It's not a million. Um, <laughs> um, but um, lots of other, lots of other instances and situations. So um, definitely um, keep an eye out for those things. And thank you so much um, to all of you for being here and for learning with us. And um, for those of you who sponsored this event, thank you, thank you, and um, we appreciate you so much. Um, so. With that, we will be finished. <laughs> um, um, thank you, Eleanor. That was amazing. And as you can see, she's amazing, right? Am I right? Um, so. <laughs> Um, so, so next we're going to, um, are we going to do a Q&A or yeah, no? Yeah, I think we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. Stay if you want for Q&A um, for, for a few minutes. And before that, I do want to thank the sponsors by name as well. Um, so um, we have the thanks to the Oklahoma Faith Network, Museum of the Bible, Oklahoma Christian University's Beam Library, Temple B'nai Israel, Oklahoma Hillel, Emmanuel Synagogue, Anita Barlow, Dr. Stephen and Roberta Sloan, Robin. It's my parents. <laughs> it's weird to say their first names. Um, Oklahoma City University's Wimberley School of Religion, Oklahoma City Community College World Languages and Cultures Center, Jewish Theater of Oklahoma, and the Jewish Federation of Greater Oklahoma City. So thank you all of you very much. Right, so uh, in Shanghai, there was a, an immigrant Jewish community that spoke Yiddish that moved to Shanghai, primarily during World War II, and did have Yiddish institutions there. Um, but there was also a Jewish community in Kaifeng uh, that spoke Chinese, and there is some evidence of texts that combine uh, Chinese characters with Hebrew characters and um, some names that include both biblical names and Chinese names together. Um, but there's very little evidence of how they spoke because by the time linguists became interested in this in the 20th century, it was 
too late and the community had uh, dissipated enough that there wasn't much to, to research. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think when we were talking about the post-vernacular engagement, this is a part of it. People gathering to read Yiddish, even if they don't know so much, and maybe some people know more than others, some fluent speakers, some who have very little knowledge, coming together to engage with the language. And a reading circle, like a Leyenkreis or a Schmuskreis, a speaking circle, are quite common. And I do see all that as part of a Yiddish renaissance. But it's important to note that it's not a renaissance in using the language for primary communication. It's a renaissance in post-vernacular engagement. Uh, any questions about theater? Uh, OK, yeah? That's a question that I don't know the answer to. Um, I think that I read something that in recent years there has been activity in Yiddish theater in Chicago, um, but I don't want to say that definitively because I wrote it down and I am not reading it right now. Um, but I, I do say that I, I did read that recently that has been happening and for sure in New York and, um, and other places for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so to start, in terms of resources for learning Ladino, I absolutely can. Um, anyone, let me know because I have I have access to to websites that um, I have access. I found classes and different lectures, especially by, I mentioned Karen Gershon Sarchon. She has had lectures about, um, about teaching and um, especially about Ladino hu humor. Um, it's a, she says it's a very funny language and there are a lot of idioms that are just very, very evocative. And she teaches, she taught a class that I think was recorded or that has some records from that that might help that um, that taught it through that that lens and that frame. And um, definitely I can send that to you and anybody else let me know. Um, yeah, and I, I can write down who that was and yeah, and definitely let me know for sure. And then in terms of the, the congregational aspect, I agree, it's very exciting. And I think there are a lot of different ways that we can engage in um, in language in a post-vernacular way in our congregations. And one, one way that I think that we already sort of do is that um, although 
Hebrew is a thriving language in Israel. A lot of us in Oklahoma City don't speak it, and yet we are engaging with it in our in our Sidurim. And when we say our prayers, we say them a lot of times in Hebrew. And sometimes we know what we're saying, and sometimes we don't. And sometimes it's just it's just the the act of saying things and singing things in Hebrew, and with the tunes then that we know, and with the the words that that just form in our mouths because we've heard it so much and um, that in and of itself. But I think that there's absolutely space for for more post-vernacular engagement with other languages like Yiddish and Ladino and Judeo-Arabic and different languages with we could have things like um, like Anita's group of, of Yiddish Yiddish speaking or Yiddish learning and having having more more engagement in that way for sure. Um, that's a great thing to talk about, for sure. <laughs> Theater-wise, yes. if one were to stage a production in a language that is not in the community, how, how would you do that? You know, if you were to bring you this theater here, right. yeah. how would you do it? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of ways to do it. One way is to have to have surtitles, to have subtitles like on like a screen above or below, um, or to have a synopsis in the in the program. Because one way one way that I I read from a lot of different scholars that have studied Jewish theater is that um, they feel like even if you don't fully speak the language you have some sort of frame of reference of how stories how stories on stage look and work and so there's some sort of context of like okay like this with the with the costumes and the way they're interacting i kind of see where we're at in kind of the arc of the story and then to have a synopsis in your program in english or in the local used language then you can have that and then follow sort of what's going on or to have subtitles or yeah there are different ways to do that for sure yeah beverly yeah <laughs> that's true that's true yeah roberta Oh, wow. So if we could bring him in to do it in English and Yiddish, that would be really great. Mm -hmm. So if anybody would like to donate and support them. <laughs> yeah, the, the Jewish Theater of Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Karen. Who said such thing in Jewish English? In Jewish English? Um, you OK. Want, you want that we should speak English? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Here, also, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, we do all that shtick to be misamech, the chosen and kala. Uh, right? And in, in Orthodox communities, it's much more distinctive, a lot of Hebrew and Yiddish. Yeah. 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 Or, or um, or at Oneg we schmooze and we have to stay a long time because oh my mom has to schmooze with with everyone and the, she loves doing it but oh sometimes I just want to go to bed and take a schluff and you know like using Yiddish in there and yeah. Well, thank you all so much, and um, thank you. <laughs> and, and feel free to take snacks to go. There's, yeah. there's a lot of food. Or stay, snack. or stay and snack. Stay and snack and schmooze, nosh, you know, all the words. <laughs> <laughs>